All righty, we are live. Um, there's a huge chunk of the country that pays no attention to politics, which is okay. And that's why my slogan here at the News with Obi is keeping you informed and not inundated with the news. Now, CNN reported that about 30 countries and more than 73 million people watched the first presidential debate on Tuesday, September 29th. Now, debates are usually when people get to know or decide which candidate they want to vote for. Did you watch the debate? Was your candidate able to convince you about what they'll do to impact your life? We'll be discussing the debate on tonight's show. And also, since the inception of the ADA in 1990, much has changed for the better. Supermarket aisles are wider, schools have ramps, and public transportation is more accessible for the disabled. However, there are still basic flaws that still remain. My guest on this episode knows too well about the flaws in the system. Janice Lentz is the founder and CEO of International Hearing Access and Innovations. And since 2002, Janice has become the global go-to person on all matters related to access for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Welcome to the show, Janice. Thank you, Obin, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And welcome everybody watching and tuning in. My name is Obi and this is the News with Obi where we talk about all things politics happening in our local community and around the world. All right, all right. Welcome back. Welcome, Janice. Thank you for taking the time out to be on the show this evening. Uh, we have a packed show tonight. We have a lot that we're going to be talking about. But first of all, let's talk about the presidential debate that happened a few days ago. Did you watch the debate? What stood out for you or what impacted you? Yes, let's hear your talk. Um, of course, I, w I watched it. Um, the, the chaos was just, of course, incredible. I mean, I'm not going to add anything really much more than every, I mean, it really wasn't a debate. It was just chaos. But yeah. I do have to say, you know, um, something that I've said, I, you know, one of the things I advocate about is also about domestic violence and uh, corruption in the court system. And it is my belief and my opinion that a lot of what we're seeing on the national front is coming from um, the matrimonial part in um, Manhattan. And the issues that we're seeing on the national front are coming from the same, um, from the matrimonial part. And that I actually testified about this in the subcommittee, the Judiciary Committee in Congress. And what is fascinating to me is Ralph Felder represented Giuliani mm -hmm. um, in his divorce against Donna Hanover. And these are the same tactic that Ralph Felder uses in divorce. And mm -hmm. they say all politics is local. And mm -hmm. I think when um, corruption and this type of inappropriate behavior and the craziness goes unchecked in the court system and the judicial system, it, it bubbles up to the national level. And I think, you know, this is something that we really need to keep checked in the local politics. Right, right. So um, I know a lot of people watch the debate, so I want to, you know, kind of like tie that in. So during the presidential debate, um, um, President Trump refused to condemn white supremacy. And when asked about the recent uprisings we've seen in recent months, instead, he said to the Proud Boys, stand back and stand down. What is your take on that? I, I, I speechless because I, I don't, our, our president of our country is supposed to unify us. And, and, and as J Ruth, um, Justice Ginsburg said, repair the tears, right, yeah. in our society. And what he did was he ripped those tears wide open and he yeah. continues to rip them further and further apart. And it's concerning. I mean, that's, to me, it's like not even a question somebody should ask you, right? Yeah. Why? Because of course you're against it, right? 
it seems almost silly you would ask that. And for him to make a statement like that is incomprehensible. Yeah. And for him not to condemn it, you know, and I would even think even if somebody is, <laughs> I don't even see some people out, like even if somebody is like racist and they, they agree with the Proud Boys, they wouldn't blatantly come out like that with a bullhorn, you know, and um, I honestly think that if he had a following, <laughs> he probably lost that particular following when he did that, you know, so. Um, but and our president isn't allowed to be racist. Exactly. Exactly. But you know what? I'm sorry. You're not, if you are racist or you are anti-Semitic, you are not allowed to be to be our president. That is yes. just unacceptable. And for people to vote for anyone like that yeah. is horrific. But to me, that was really a call for why people need to get to the election polls yeah. and use their power of voting yeah. to vote him out. Yeah. Plain and simple. And every single person's vote makes a huge difference. You know, yeah. my ballot is sitting by the door waiting to go to the mailbox tomorrow. Awesome. That's amazing. And, you know, that will also segue into November 3rd. I know we have a lot to talk about, but, I, you know, since we're talking about voting, November 3rd is fastly approaching. What do you have to say to people that believe their vote doesn't count? Every single vote counts. First off, in this election, you know, it's such a crapshoot of what's going to happen. I mean, our country is in such absolute chaos, but every single person's vote matters. And every single person is so lucky to have that privilege to vote that mm -hmm. no one should take it away from you. And we have fought way too hard for every single person to vote. I'm voting. I urge every single person in this country to get out there and vote. We need to send a very clear message that yeah. this is not who our country is. We are not going to be the laughing stock anymore and yeah. we are not going to put up with this nonsense and the way we do that is by voting yeah that's it that we have to go make our voices heard um and i know that uh, um, the president now is pushing to get a just uh, um a chief justice in the in the you know to replace rbg you know we've been kind of like speaking up about that not to replace that till after inauguration but we'll we'll see how that plays out now the title welcome everybody i see people are tuning and watching thank you i appreciate you taking your time if you do have questions for janice please um um type it in the comment section so we can um read it out the title of today's show is americans with disabilities act and the flaws in the system as advanced as we are here in the US, why is it that in 2020, we still see some discrimination against people with disabilities? Because the way, um, and I should just know, my um, organization's name is Hearing Access and, and Innovations, not International Hearing okay. Access. Hearing in okay, well, I'll um, change that while you talk. Thank you. But the reason we're still seeing um, discrimination is the ADA is a federally unfunded mandate. Um, that has no teeth. And so the problem is that access was implemented into this act, but there's nobody, you know, like we both live in New York. And if you go around New York City, you see restaurants with letter symbols, mm -hmm. you know, being rated based on the health department. And there's some health department inspector who's going around and inspecting the restaurants. Right. There is no one going around and inspecting the access for people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So as a result, the access only gets reported by the people who need the access. And that shifts the burden onto the people who need it the most. And that's not appropriate. And so we need inspectors um, and some way to implement uh, a mechanism to make sure that the access is implemented. So it's also pretty similar to the issues the Civil Rights Act had. So the Civil Rights Act to me was pretty self-evident, right? Right. Do not discriminate based on race. Yeah. Except we had, Lyndon Johnson had to augment it with the Voting Rights Act because there were some people who didn't think the Civil Rights Act applied to voting. Right. Even though it was self-evident to the people who benefited, to everyone else, it was this right. group that didn't. Right. The same with the ADA. The ADA is, is similar to the Civil Rights Act and there really needs to be a second act implemented as an enforcement mechanism okay. to 
And the other problem we have is um, when acts are passed, they required someone people to do something. Mm -hmm. There has to be a corresponding code in the um, procurement codes that come out of OMB, okay. the Office of Management and Budget, because yeah. the access that is being implemented, there is no procurement code for it. So for people with hearing loss, for example, um, the type of access that is preferable is something called an induction loop. It's um, behind us in, on the picture. Yeah, I see it. Is the ear symbol that right. you see on our taxis. Yeah, and yeah. that's called an induction loop. There is no procurement code for that. In So there's no way to fund it? Well, what happens is when people bid it out, they mm -hmm. bid it with a more generic term. Okay. And if they don't target the contracts very clear, induction right. loop, right? right? Right. Then the person who is bidding is making the decisions of what to bid for, right? If they just say some sort of access for people with hearing loss or you are ADA compliant, who knows what that means? Mm. And then the, the person who is bidding to ensure that they win the bid is going to bid on the cheapest thing possible or and or the easiest to install. Yeah. But the bidding should be based on what benefits the end user, the person with the disability, not to ensure the person gets the contract. Do they even in, do they do they include people with disabilities when they decide to make this decision? How do they know exactly what they need? Because I, I have a brother with a disability, and whenever we have his yearly meetings, um, he's nonverbal. So I make sure I'm at those meetings to make sure that I advocate for exactly what he needs and how it's been written in the con you know every year so do they include you know people with hearing loss that will benefit from this because if not how will they know exactly well that's kind of complicated so part of it is if they do include the people with the disability yeah. how are they selecting those people are those political hacks right so i attended one committee and the person had no clue how their own hearing aid worked right so mm. that would be tantamount as saying that every person who is black is representative of the whole race, right? right. Uh, there are people in every group that we do not want advocating for anything, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter what your group is, you do not want, like not everybody's representative of the group. Yeah. So if someone is appointed by a political hack, that person may not have knowledge. Just because you put a hearing aid into your ear doesn't suddenly impute all the knowledge of how work that hearing aid the second you put it into your ear. Right. So sometimes the people may be included, but they have no idea. Many times they're not included. And if they include people with disabilities, so it's kind of like the best way to explain it is um, you see it in the Hispanic community, right? Mm -hmm. You have people from different countries who speak Spanish, mm -hmm. but all the different countries have very different needs and are very different. Right. Just because you speak Spanish in Mexico is not the same as if you speak Spanish mm -hmm. in Spain, right? right. Right. very different needs, but they just take this umbrella category of disabilities and it presumes that the person who uses a wheelchair knows exactly what a person with hearing loss knows, needs, but there is no comparison. So, so how, how, how have you been able to, you know, go around dealing with, cause this sounds like a really big problem. How have you been going around to deal with that? How has states been dealing with it? So what I did was um, I started, when my daughter was diagnosed with a hearing loss, which is how I got started in this, mm -hmm. um, and I started learning about all these different problems and nothing made sense. And I usually find when things don't make sense, it's because they don't. Right. And so I, what I did was I started small on the projects that were most meaningful to our family. I never intended to have a project. I right. intended to solve problems for our family. Yeah. And, so I started with small projects of, you know, when my daughter was little, we would go to different theaters, like music shows for my daughter. Um, we would go to Lincoln Center. We would go to the circus. And I worked on those places to fix. Yeah. And then I started working on more places like that. And then I realized that it was easiest to fix um, places that were name brand mm -hmm. recognition, right? Mm -hmm. If I fix Lincoln Center and I explained it to the audience, there's a good chance, even if you don't live in New York, you've heard of Lincoln Center. Of course. But if I said, 
the local theater that no one's ever heard of, nobody ever heard of that. So I decided it was easier if I worked on big projects that had brand name recognition because- That's a good way to go, yeah. Right, I could scale it. If I then took it and said, I fixed access at Lincoln Center, which I did, I can then take that project and go to Greece, which I did, mm. and help them fix hearing access at their new opera house because right. I had credibility working with Lincoln Center. Right. And so that's right. what I did. I created New York City as a best practice model. Yeah. And then used New York City to expand across the country. Yeah. And then now moving globally. But I used, when I created New York City, I looked around the world to see what access was happening in other countries. And I would find bits and pieces of access in various places. Like you'll find this interesting. When I was in Nigeria last year, mm -hmm. I didn't see hearing access. Yeah. But what I did find rare, but, but this is shocking, in the Sheraton in Abuja, mm -hmm. the elevator had an induction loop. Really? That's... I, was, I got to send you a picture. Random, right? That's random. Yeah. Really random. I'm going to send you a picture. <laughs> really random. And you're like, okay, this is crazy. It's yeah. not in museums that I went to, didn't see it in any museum, but in the elevator. So when I see something like that, I will then approach, um, let's say, so it's a Sheridan. Yeah. So we'll approach Sheridans and say, okay, why is it in this elevator? Because when I've stayed at other Sheridans, they didn't have I, it. I didn't see it in Djibouti. I didn't see it. Why? Mm -hmm. Why is it one elevator or not? The other way I will approach is then I'll go to the overarching brand of the co of the company, which would be Marriott, and say, yeah. okay, why is it not across other Marriott hotels? Right. I will go to the elevator company and then say, okay, you're one elevator, another elevator company. When you're putting it in, can you put every time you install an elevator because it's a safety issue? If someone gets stuck in an elevator, mm. and hearing aid, they can't hear the person over the speaker unless they turn um, their and to explain an induction loop. It's you turn your hearing aid or cochlear implant to the T setting, and the sound is electromagnetically transmitted to your hearing aid or cochlear implant. Yes. So if you're speaking through the um, speaker in the elevator, you can hear the person. So then I will go to elevator companies and ask them, please add this. And then that will help if they agree to, it will spread globally. Yeah. And then I use that as a model of excellence to, so if let's say Sheraton adds it right to all their hotels. Yeah. They renovate. Let's say they start renovating, they add it, right? Now, anytime there's a Sheraton or a Marriott brand hotel, that access is in place and that becomes a model of ex excellence. People see it and then they add it to other places within their state or country. Makes a lot of sense. But I'm sure you must have gotten a lot of pushback um, when you first started this. How was that? What kind of pushback did you get? Oh, I still get pushback. <laughs> there is no easy project. I can count on one hand the number of easy projects. Yeah. The, literally. I mean, the taxi project took nine years. What? You know, nine years, wow. that, which is insane. But wow. when it impacts your child or for you, a sibling, yeah. you have no choice. You know, when I was told this is going to be my life in this special world, mm. I lived in Manhattan at the time. And I didn't do special unless it was really good, right? And yeah. this was not a good special. This was a bad special. And I didn't want to be part of that world. Yeah. I wanted to continue living my life. And so I decided it was easier to change the world than to lower my standards. Yes. And yeah. I'm trained as an attorney, but that really had nothing. I was just not taking no for an answer. And yeah. I think because of the corruption I dealt with in the courts as yeah. well, that also, you know, I had already been working on the hearing access, but dealing with the craziness in the courts and I used, and having my voice silenced in the courts, mm. I used hearing access to give me a voice. I hear you, yes. So it really, as much as I helped hearing access, hearing access helped me. Yeah. And so I was able to just, I love what I do and I'm able to get it done. And it was a matter of just piecing things. And so a lot of the times when I got pushback, yeah. I am super organized and I maintain phone logs. Mm -hmm. And so I would track everything and piece things together and mm -hmm. use things like almost like doing a jig jigsaw puzzle where yeah. people don't 
you start at the edges. You don't start at the, you know, when you do a puzzle, you don't do the easy part. You start the in the edges where people aren't paying attention. Yeah. And then you piece it together. And by the time it gets to the middle, it's too late, right? The stuff is in place. Right. I work on a lot of projects. People can't really tell what I'm doing. They have no idea who I'm working with. And somehow it falls together. So um, and when you went to Nigeria, were you able to make any progress with the Sheraton or just in general? Because I know when before we went on live, you said you met with governors and on, and um, kings and chiefs and stuff like that. Did you make any progress? Um, I didn't work on the elevator project yet. Actually, that's on my, my to-do list now. I, um, I was traveling for the last bit of months and then working on various projects. So now I'm now like slowly moving my way through projects to work on the elevator and figure out that out. Okay. Um, but I did work. Actually, I helped. Um, when I went, I went about hearing aids and I was able to start a hearing aid had gone to Nigeria to bring hearing aids on a separate mission to bring hearing aids to um, people with hearing loss right. in Nigeria who couldn't afford hearing aids. And I helped um, elevate some of that, the states and the governors I worked with to mm -hmm. make sure that those children received hearing aids. That's amazing. Thank you for doing that. That's awesome. I, I actually didn't know this. I know, it's random. Yeah. Oh, I was noticing your last name because it was distinctly Nigerian. But I realized that, wait a second, are you from Nigeria? And that, we haven't spoken about that. Yeah, we haven't talked about that. But that's that's really awesome. Thank you. And just, I don't know if you keep up, if you do keep up with what's going on in Nigeria and the, the kids that got the hearing aids, please um, keep me posted because I'll definitely like to bring you back on the show to um, follow up on that progress as well. Do you plan on going to other African countries? Yes, I've been to half of the continent already. Wow, okay. Um, I'm actually, pre-pandemic, my goal was to visit every country in the world. Oh, nice. And, yeah, so I've done about half the, half the continent. Um, I have a lot on the West Africa and Central African portion to do. I've okay. done a lot of the North, most of the East, um, and the Southern, but I, ha I have still big chunks to do. In yeah. the and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you have a team um, that works, that travels with you. Yeah. No, it, it, I went with a different, with a group of people and it was a complicated situation. But um, when I'm traveling on myself, I'm with guides that I'm traveling with. Um, okay. Guides it depends, from on the, the it depends on the country, you know, Africa, each country is so distinct. Yeah. The perception from America is that um, it's all, Africa is a country, but each country is so it's very different. different. Yeah. And I have a friend of four. She's from Ghana. She's saying thank you. for. Oh, I love my, doing it. Have you gone to Ghana? No. And I'm dying to because um, I've been visiting along the coast um, and the slave trade. Like I had been to Sierra Leone, okay. um, Liberia yeah. uh, as well, and visiting um, the various um points, um, what's, um, what did I just blank out? The points of no return. Okay, okay, yes, yes, yes. And so visiting the castles in Ghana to me um, is fascinating. And I, I yeah. had hoped to go, but pandemic has, you know, yeah. kept all of us from leaving our apartments. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> and speaking of the pandemic, you and I, we live in um, New York City and um, New York City COVID-19 positivity tests has tripled in the last days at 3%, which could potentially lead to shutting down schools. In your opinion, and in your, you know, everything we've seen going on, what should the city, how can the city contain the spike? Are we, do you foresee a second wave? Oh, I've seen the second wave happening for a long time. I'm near <laughs> Brooklyn Hospital, so I've heard. Oh, wow. And so even though it wasn't being reported for a while. Yeah. Of course, it was happening. Yeah. And you know what? I, I I'm of the opinion it's there has to be mass. You yeah. can't, you can't ignore this. And yeah. the communities who are not using masks need yeah. to be shut down. They need to be fined. They need yeah. to be shut down because yeah. they are putting first off the first responders at risk. Yes. And, and there are people who are diligently working so hard to help the community. And other people are being so cavalier about their lives. Yeah. No one 
has the right to risk their lives when other people are working so hard. Oh and that is just oh so not right. That's irresponsible. Irresponsible it's and selfish. Yeah. And, and when I see people not wearing a mask, I just think you must be just the most selfish human being yeah. on the face because yeah. I'm walking around when I'm walking around. If you see me when on the limited times I leave to go to a medical appointment, yeah. I have a 95 mask, um, a three ply mask, a face shield, gloves, glasses. I, I'm not going to be on the, you know, the front of the post of like, but you know what? I want to live. Yeah. And to me, it's not too much to ask, but yeah. I, not just, I see police officers not wearing masks. Not masks. wearing masks. That's I saw that for a long time. I'm like, what is this? I see construction workers not wearing a mask. Sorry, put on the mask. I know. You know, I and know. people wearing the mask below the nose. Like, what is that? <laughs> and it's not a mask to cover your double What's chin. It? Yeah. Not your double chin. We know what you're doing. Put yeah. on a mask. Yeah. I, um... I went back to work for the first time in six months and two weeks ago was my first time on the subway in six months. And you know, on the subway now they started, they said they're going to start finding people $50 if they don't have a mask on. And they have signs all over the place, some pictures of how to wear the mask, how not to wear the mask. You literally see people looking at the picture of how not to wear the mask and they're still wearing it the same way. And I'm like, I'm on real Am I missing something here? You know, so I um, it's 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 crazy. And uh, and Trump supposedly tested for positive for COVID this morning, and um, I think the timing is kind of odd. <laughs> and uh, my question to that is, why now? And what's the catch? Well, we're, we're gonna see what the next two weeks or how the next two weeks is gonna play out with that. So. Um, and again, thank you for, for tuning in and everybody else watching. I appreciate you. If you have any questions, if, if you have any, she hasn't been to Ghana yet. If you have any questions about Ghana and the hearing aid, um, please um, feel free to type that in the comment section. So I know we've talked about some of the projects that you're currently working on. I'm fascinated now that I know that you've been to African countries doing this. So talk to us about the country. Do you, I'm sure you do. What kind of feedback or uh, pushback did you get when you first went go, went to the African countries? I'm going to start with Nigeria because I know they gave you some pushback. Well, it wasn't so much they were pushed back and it was um, a crazy thing that I don't want to discuss on, on air because there was complications. Okay. But what they were looking for was funding and money. Um, yeah as you would expect, but yeah. you know, it, it's a, co a complicated um, political system and yeah. financial system. So yeah. it's very complicated. But what was sad to me was seeing the schools with children who hadn't been tested. And so they didn't even know what level of their hearing loss was. And the fact was that some of those children needed hearing aids and didn't have to be deaf. But mm -hmm. they, were being, they were living a life as in silence when they needed hearing aids. Oh, God. So it's so frustrating, you know, when you hear that there are some people who have hearing aids and they're taking jet planes to the United States or the United Kingdom yeah. to get hearing aids, and other people have nothing. You know, there's a, I'm not explaining anything new. There, you know, there, it's a lot of, it's very complicated. Yeah. Um, I will say most of the countries, you know, that I went to in Africa don't, the access is not the same as when you're in European countries. Right. I didn't really see access. I actually wrote an article for Forbes Africa. Um, okay. Pulling out um, the apartheid museum. Mm. Because that was, you know, when you're going to, let's say, in Nigeria, um, I can't remember how to pronounce it, but the museum about slavery with a B. Um, uh, um, uh, yeah, I know which one you're talking about. I can't remember them. It's in Lagos. In Lagos, exactly. I, I cannot, I just blanked on the name and I apologize. Yeah. Um, but I don't expect a museum like that is going to have, you know, it's a very small museum, yeah. really well done, you know, yeah. explaining the history with natural artifacts, you know, yeah. original artifacts. But when I go to the apartheid museum in South Africa, that was had a lot of money pumped into that of museum. Of course, yeah, a lot of money. It is really probably one of the hallmarks on the continent. Yeah. And when I didn't see hearing access, that's unacceptable. Yeah. Um, 
And so, and their excuse at the apartheid museum was they couldn't afford the hearing access. There wasn't enough money. And well, I, 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 yeah, no, but that's, I haven't been, but I doubt that's probably what it was. But to me, that's crazy because that was the excuse white people used to black people of why they couldn't give black children books, right? Yeah. So yeah. if it didn't work then, it doesn't work now. Yeah. And I called out the apartheid museum about that because yeah. that museum should have had hearing access, and hearing access, and they forgot about it clearly. Yeah. And it wasn't built, and that's unacceptable. Yeah, yeah. And this is not that I didn't know about it. I mean, it's been hearing aid has been around for how long now? A, a very long time. And you know what? They, they when they built the apartheid museum, they used a world class architectural firm. And the problem is. When they get to on the budget, what happens is when you build a museum in, in many countries, I can't s discuss every country, 193 countries, but mm. in the United States, um, especially in New York, I can talk when you're building. So in the United States, the way it works is if you take a building and mm. and the way the AD works is, and this is a rough guesstimate, a rough way to explain it. If you yeah. take a building and you turn it upside down and you shake it, right? Mm. Yeah. Everything that stays in the building, yeah. right, it's, is attached. Right. Falls, is called a fixture, basically. Right. Came out of the building codes to the Rehabilitation Act. And now the U.S. Access Board oversees it. Everything that fell out of the building is called programmatic access. And mm -hmm. the Department of Justice oversees it. So you have two government agencies overseeing the Americans with Disabilities Act. Yeah. So there, right away, you have a problem. And it's not just two, because you have, if you fly on an airplane, you have the Department of Transportation. If you go to the Smithsonian, a quasi-federal agency, you yeah. have the Appropriations Committee. So every time you have multiple agencies, and then forgetting about state and city agencies, mm -hmm. you have, between the two agencies, there's crevices, right? Because one agency says, no, it's the other one. The other one says, it's this one. And yeah. so you have these crevices, and that's where the problems happen. So when you're building a museum and you want to open, you need to comply with the architectural issues, right? The stuff that stayed in to get your certificate of occupancy, your CFO. Yeah. Right, right. The Department of Justice stuff, you can open without having those access, right? You can get yeah. your certificate of occupancy without that access. So yeah. when the budget's getting tight, they open with the physical access, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe the hearing access in a theater in a museum, but all the other programmatic access that you'd see for the videos mm -hmm. or the entrances, you know, by the entrance points, yeah, those are forgotten because the budget's tight. They're running over budget. Cut, cut, cut. We'll do it at some point. Some point is no point, and so it never gets put in. What is what is and and that's really that's because now you got me thinking like what is the number of people that need hearing aid in, in the U.S.? Do you know that number? Well, 48 million people have some form of hearing loss. Wow. The problem is most people cannot afford a hearing aid because quality hearing, and then that's a whole nother issue. I testified before the FDA on this issue. So hearing aids, people assume work the way they say they do, but right. there's no testing of hearing aids. What happens is because like all other medical devices, yeah. testing is expensive. Yeah. So the way companies can avoid testing is by passing new hearing aids or new versions of hearing aids under a standard called the functional equivalence of the predecessor. Mm. So therefore it never gets tested. And therefore when people are advertising hearing aids and they're making claims about what it can do, we have no idea if they are delivering what they claim they do. And the whole point of setting up the FDA was to prevent the sale of snake oil. Exactly. But if you don't test the hearing aids, then we don't know if people are selling us snake oil. Now, what's crazy is these hearing aids cost upwards of $8,000, right? Really? I didn't know. I didn't realize it cost that. Oh, yeah. If for quality, quote, quality hearing aids, $8,000, that's a lot of money for most that people. Is, that is a lot of money. Yeah. Right? And now you're buying something that you have no idea if it delivers what right. it claims, right? You can't read consumer reports or articles comparing because there is no testing. So now you're relying on the person who sells that hearing aid, 
which tends to be an audiologist or a hearing aid dispenser. But the problem is the person who is prescribing the hearing aid is also selling the hearing aid. So you have an inherent conflict of interest. So again, like the person who's installing the devices, you're going to sell what's easiest to program and generates the most profit. That's pretty much follow the money, right? And so that is crazy because you don't know if you have a hearing loss, is the audiologist selling you a hearing aid that you need, or maybe or they don't trying to make money. Hearing aid. right? Yeah. Or maybe they don't carry a hearing aid that you need, but they don't really know because they don't really know what they're selling. And is Macy's, not to date myself, going to send you to Gimbal's? If it mm-hmm. takes on, on average seven years for a person from the point they think they have a hearing loss to when they buy a hearing aid, or is someone who's been working on that sale for quote seven years? going to tell you, I don't carry a hearing aid, but I think this one will be better for you. So go to my, go to this other person and they're going to lose that sale. Not going to well, happen. I, 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 on a, I think the FDA is a little lax. There are a lot of things they don't test. I mean, they're, you know, I'm also in skincare and there are a lot of skincare products on the market that's not even approved by the FDA. Am I missing something? There are a lot of things that they let go on the market. I mean, they'll tell you it's not approved by the FDA. Doesn't mean people won't still buy it. Is the FDA in the backlog? Do you have any insight on that? <laughs> well, I can't speak to skincare products because that's not my expertise. But mm-hmm. in terms of hearing aids, I spoke to seven. I was an Aspen Institute scholar, Spotlight on Health. And okay. there were seven um, FDA commissioners, Formaner and the one sitting commissioner. And I went through and learned about this functional equivalency. So in 2009, I submitted a petition to the FDA asking for testing of hearing aids and using international ANSI, ANSI standards. That's a a testing standard of the hearing aids using and having the FDA ask for generic features Mm. and the features, right? So if a hearing aid has a restaurant noise, you know, restaurant um, setting, noise canceling setting, background canceling setting. We call that one feature, right? Okay. We call that one name, okay, noise canceling, right? right? And now we compare all the noise canceling hearing aids and we test that feat, that setting with these international standards and we make a giant Excel spreadsheet. Mm. And if somebody's delivering what they claim they are, that company should be thrilled because now they have quantifiable evidence that they're delivering what they're playing. Yeah. If they don't, well, we should know that, right? Because yeah. you're basically then selling snake oil. Why are you selling this overpriced piece of garbage? Right. And that's the problem. And the and so a lot of times hearing needs sit in the drawer because people are dissatisfied with them, but they spent a lot of money. money. And how many different pairs of $8,000 hearing aids are you going to buy? You're lucky if you buy one. Yeah. So I went to, because of that, I was so frustrated, I went to Senator Warren at a conference at Hunter's Roosevelt House on credit cards. And most people thought hearing aids was a healthcare or ADA issue. I thought it was an, a monopoly issue because there are only six companies in the world that make hearing aids. Oh, wow. And my goal was to disrupt the entire industry. Mm. And one of the ways by doing that was to sell hearing aids over the counter. Because if we're not testing them, what's the point of the FDA, right? And we're passing mm. every pair of hearing aids right. as functional equivalent. I'm not really sure what the whole point of the FDA is on hearing it. Right. So Senator Warren um, introduced a bill with Senator Grassley that Trump did sign. And hearing aids will be sold over the counter, except they're supposed to set up regulations and they haven't done that and it's languished. Um, So I'm hoping in the next presidential administration that they will create some standards, but when hearing aids are sold over the counter, they will become less expensive and that will open up the whole market to the world, but we still need testing. Because every time one of these companies comes out, we see, all see the ads in magazines, newspapers, online. And they say, oh, no, this is great. Look how fabulous this is. And I write to them and I say, and I see them in LinkedIn all the time, all the audiologists coming, oh, this new product. I'm like, great. Do you have testing with international ANSI standards? Oh, no, we haven't done that yet. 
Well, <laughs> how do you know what you're saying is true? Yeah. Oh, I'm supposed to trust you. I trust no one, right? Based yeah. on our country's friend, we trust no one anymore. We're yeah. not even sure if the president really is sick, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> we have our own, you know, we've all become conspiracy theorists at this point right. in our country. Right. right, because nobody believes anything anymore. No, it's, it's it's hard to believe when it seems we've been gaslighted for so long. Like, what what is? How do we know if, whether he's sick or not? But I really want to thank you for um all you do. I want to thank you for uh, taking on such a project. I know it came about from you know your daughter, but still, you are making a huge impact, changing the world one person at a time. And I can't thank you enough. Thank well, thank you. you. So thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And if for, you know, my friend from Ghana, she's saying, uh, I think so, because she's never heard much about hearing aid in Ghana. So she is saying also thank you for doing everything um, that you're doing. So how can our viewers find you? How can we support these projects that you're doing? Do you have a website we can go to? Is there a petition we need to sign? Talk to us. Well, there's two. Um, so uh, there's my website, hearingaccess.com. Okay. And then my personal website, that's my business website. My personal advocacy website is janislintz.com, spelled like my name. Yeah. And then one of my goals is for companies like Apple to add the telecoil. Think about this. This is one of my, if I can accomplish this, this will be super exciting. But yeah. think about AirPods, right? You put right. them in here. Exactly. Now, imagine if you, they had that same telecoil feature so that when you're in the taxi or you're in the airport and you hear gate ch changes, you can hear them in your um, AirPod just by switching on a switch. How amazing would that be, right? That, that would, would be awesome. Like, that would be awesome, right? Yeah. So we make hearing access, universal access. And once you make, it's kind of like what people did with curb cuts, right? You yeah. see curb cuts originally for people with wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. but every person who uses a stroller can you yeah. love, like we all love curb yeah. cuts, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and therefore it makes it universal and more likely it will exist. So I wow. have um, a petition on um, change.org and I can um, send you it's um i don't know if you see the comment section on your end if you do you can type it in yeah i'm no. grabbing the link and okay. i'm putting it right here yep. and i ask everybody to please sign this petition because companies respond to when there's demand yeah and it, it will transform everyone's experience. Like you will be able to, like, you know where it would be great? Imagine you go like, okay, pandemic's over, right? And yeah. now you have to be hopeful. You go to see the show Hamilton, right? In New York? Yeah. So Hamilton has an induction loop in the theater. Right. So imagine if you put in your AirPods and you can hear Hamilton, which has a lot of, you know, it moves really quick if you haven't yeah. seen it. It, yeah, you, I've, I've, I've seen it. Right. It's hard to follow. It, you know, like it's much easier to follow if you wear a headset. But imagine no one's going to ever put on a headset again post pandemic. Nobody wants to touch anybody else's anything. Right. No, we want our own. So imagine yeah. if you stick an AirPod in your ear. Right. And right. you can hear Hamilton directly in your ear. And while not you're watching it. while you're watching the show, not yeah. hearing the people next to you chattering about how cute so-and-so is, right? Block them <laughs> out. <laughs> That's awesome. So I, I, for some reason I can't copy and paste. So it's on change.org. I can type it in so people can see it. Yeah. The um, you know what I can, what I could do is I could email it to you. Um, yeah, I don't like if you, even if we paste it on here, it won't be clickable. That's the thing. It won't be clickable for the people watching. Uh, but if I can put it up on the screen, just tell me what it is. It's on change.org and what's the name of it? Do you? Do it's um, about if you hearing access on um, AirPods. Okay. T coils, in, T coils in AirPods. But I just emailed you the link to make it a little easier. Okay. 
when I post it on, when I post this on, um, I'm going to go to, when, we, when we're done, I'll take that link and edit it in. So that Great, excellent. To watch because it, it would be wonderful um, to get more people to support this petition. So Apple hears our voices and adds yeah. the T-coil into. Um, and so this will be beneficial, not just for people that need hearing, it'd be beneficial for all of us. Yeah, well, because what it will it, what it will do is people with hearing aids can't wear AirPods because they're basically already wearing receivers. Yeah, it will allow induction loops to become universal access. So when you go to a museum yeah. and they have an induction loop and it's noisy, and you know how like you go to a museum and there's you can't hear the videos. I don't know. People design these exhibits to be cool, but they make them so noisy. Noisy, yeah, yeah. But if you put the AirPods in your ear, you would yeah. be able, if it had a T-coil, you yeah. could hear that video directly in your ear. Yeah, wow. That's How amazing. cool would that be? That would be too cool. Because I recently got the Apple um, noise cancellation AirPods. Yeah, the Pro. I, was, I, was blown, I was blown away. I couldn't hear my own footsteps. I got scared. I'm like, I cannot be running in Brooklyn on the streets with that noise cancellation. That's too dangerous. But yeah, I can imagine having the um, the T cords. That would be awesome. By the way, you can set your your AirPods so that you can hear. Yeah. yeah, you can. I figured it out. I didn't read the manual before I put it in. It was afterwards <laughs> that I'm like, oh, I can actually do that. But um, yeah, thank you. This has been an awesome conversation. Thank you for taking the time out. And thank you, everybody that tuned in. If you're going to be listening to this later on the News with Obi podcast, I thank you as well. The show will live on Facebook and YouTube at the News with Obi. And now you can find us on um, Ask Alexa to pull up the News with Obi podcast. You can play it on Amazon. You can find us on Apple Music and on Spotify. This particular episode will be uploaded by the weekend. And um, the News with Obi runs on donations. You know, I take time to do this and I enjoy doing it. But, you know, people throw me donations here and there. If you have anything, you know, feel free to donate, people watching. And I really want to thank Janice for being on the show. This has been really informative. So much I did not know about hearing aids that I learned today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You should join Patreon, which is another platform to be able to get donations. Yes, I am going to join. I've, people have been telling me to join Patreon. I am going to do that. And um, election day, November 3rd, is about a few weeks away. So please make sure you send in your ballots. If you are going out to vote in person and early like I'm doing, make sure you mask up, you know, wear your shirt, wear with a bubble wrap if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> but no matter what, please, we need to let our voices be heard. This election, like every election is important, but this one is particularly important. A lot is at stake here. And um, wear your mask. Thank you, everybody, for watching and listening. Have a good night. Thank you and good night. Vote. Don't forget to vote. Yes. <laughs>